welcome to the Daily Space Weather, another exciting 24-hour chapter in our pushing six-year saga of covering the space weather here for you in detail as the Smash News Network brings you the most detailed coverage of space weather and comprehensive imagery of the closest star you'll see anywhere in the known universe. I'm your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash a -Mash, and thanks for stargazing with us. That's the past 24 hours of El Sol's activity, or if you prefer, Helios. There was indeed an X2 class flare, some coronal mass ejections, and a conflagration. That is, more sunspots showing up. And of course, yesterday we streamed it on Twitch. There is the moment of the X class solar flare. There was a coronal mass eject ejection accompanying that as well. And you may see a simul event over here as there's a flare happening on the opposite side of the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk at the same time. So always interesting. You may be looking for some quality imagery of that. Well, if so, you certainly came to the right place. There's the past 24 hours in 171 angstroms. The original footage we showed you was 131 plus 171 angstroms and let's take a brief look at sunspots here we'll go a little more in depth here's a quick overview of what's going on and what's going on is an increase in the sunspot number and the radio flux so we've got growth over here we've got growth down here and near the equator we've got a large sunspot having formed in the southeast uh, we've got some umbral migration here as these groups are spreading apart from each other and that covers most of it. Here's your colorized magnetogram. That imagery, like this imagery, is yesterday plus today. That's the SDO browse data feature. What's cool about that is you can, of course, rock it back and forth if there's some event that you're looking at. If you're trying to take uh, images of a specific moment, the SDO browse data is great for that. Let's take a brief look at what's going on on the Earth here. Shivaluch is erupting again today, back to a 13,000-foot ash plume as it explodes. It's a flight level 130 over Kamchatka. Abiko also erupting there, 10,000-foot ash plume, flight level 100 over Abiko. Sakurajima exploding, uh, flight level 070, that's a 7,000-foot ash plume. Suwanose Jima, 7,000-foot ash plume also. Dakono. Also a 7,000-foot ash plume. Flight level 070 over Halmahera. Heading down to central Mexico here. Popocatépetl exploding. Flight level 200, 20,000-foot ash plume. And south, no Central American volcanoes here, but we've got Nevado de Ruiz in Colombia exploding. Flight level 220. Revenador exploding in Ecuador. Flight level 150. And Sabancaya exploding in Peru. Flight level 240. Let's look at seismicity. We did almost send out an earthquake alert to Smash Team members. If you weren't aware of that, you can join the Smash Team. Even bronze-level Smash Team members get natural disaster alerts. Uh, so, you know, join at the gold, silver, or bronze level. If you want email alerts about things like tsunamis, we saw an alert come through and decided not to send it. So we typically get them out before USGS, if all is going according to plan, if we don't have a thing like an internet outage. Anyway, there's the past 90 days of seismicity. The largest quake of the past 24 came in earlier this morning. It was a 6.9 there in between uh, New Zealand and Samoa in the Kermadec Trench there. And the reason we didn't do a tsunami alert is because it was at a depth of 205.7 kilometers. So that came in at 641 this morning. Not likely to have produced a tsunami, so let's move on. We'll cover the earthquakes over a 5 magnitude, like this 5.6 at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. As the last 24 hours have been pretty calm as far as seismicity, not a lot of quakes and certainly not a lot of big quakes. So the 5.0 at the Kermadec Islands there was a foreshock. Note that that happened near the surface at 18.7 kilometers. And then this 6.9 occurred at 205.7 kilometers there at 641 this morning. That's 641 universal time. And let's get back to space where the action is. And there is plenty of it. In the meantime, we will be back to space. Make sure you press like and subscribe. You'd probably like us to show you some spectacular imagery of that solar flare, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Is that what you're looking for? Would you like information about CMEs, etc.? Press like, subscribe, share, etc. The video is unable to continue until you do so. Just kidding, folks. Of course, this is not 
streamed live to YouTube. If you do enjoy the content, consider becoming a member of the Smash Team at smashomash.com slash smash team. It's our official subscription services site. We started it back in October of 2021 just because it affords capabilities that Patreon does not have. So we are still on Patreon also. If you prefer that, if you want to support the channel that way, feel free. Shout out to Smash Staff for being our social media manager. And yeah, also our IT department. So help support the channel by becoming a member of the Smash team. Again, there's a bronze level also if you're unable and or unwilling to open your cobweb encrusted wallet. And let's get back to space. Space, a frontier. These are the voyages of the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. Now we're showing 171 angstroms plus 211, two different species of ionized iron. And this shows amazing depth in the solar corona here. So the 171 angstroms wavelength shows the lower corona and the 211 angstroms wavelength shows all the way out to the outer corona. The 211 is the pinkish color. The 171 is the gold color. And <clears throat> that's just a great couple of wavelengths there. It also does provide great definition for that coronal hole, which we can expect a high-speed wind from sometime tomorrow. So the 10.7 centimeter radio flux now up to 175 solar flux units. Uh, there were a lot of channels on YouTube suggesting that the radio flux would not go back over 170. It would just drop down there as we were, quote, at solar max, and quote, just not the case. There is the latest one-year chart of the radio flux, the black line, there's the radio flux. The pink line is the 30-day wolf number, which is like the av the smooth sunspot number. The red line is the sunspot number, and the blue line is the AP index, the interplanetary Potsdam AP, the interplanetary magnetic field. Space Weather Enthusiast dashboard here, again, <clears throat> forecasting some geomagnetic storm conditions. Uh, starting early in the day tomorrow, that sounds about right, perhaps. Yeah, I think that sounds about good. Uh, so we can expect to see uh, a high-speed coronal hole wind stream showing up at first with a density spike. Now, as far as the CMEs that were associated with that large X-class flare that we will get to in depth here in a moment, uh, we don't see any, any models, at least by NOAA or NASA, that show that they're earthly directed. We will look later in the video manually just to make sure because oftentimes... Uh, forecasts are wrong, CME is not, for, not modeled, and so on. As far as the Integrated Space Weather Analysis Center models, uh, those do not appear to be out yet. So we don't see any recent CMEs here on these models. Uh, we just loaded that up this morning, so uh, that not updated yet. Again, we'll tell you about trajectories of those CMEs here uh, later in the video. First, the Planetary K Index, Geomagnetic Calm Conditions of KP3. It's just a nominal KP index. And here's the last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space. And of course, on the right pane there, you can see part of the reason why we call Earth croissant-shaped. As the magnetic moment is largely croissant-shaped, if you're a solar proton viewing the planet from the side at least. Anyway, again, pretty calm conditions here. Geomagnetic calm, KP3. Here's Earth's magnetic moment from the ground for the past four hours. And we show this because a lot of people are very scared and spooked about magnetic reversals and polar excursions and so on. If anything major was happening, it should show us in this as this takes in account a lot of data. So that's what's going on the past four hours on the surface level. Let's take a look at the real-time solar wind here measured at Lagrangian point one. So remember, the real-time solar wind is measured outside Earth's magnetosphere by the Discover and ACE spacecraft primarily. And uh, at the moment, we're just seeing the Discover here. So current conditions are 521 kilometers per second, still an elevated solar wind speed there, 521 kilometers per second solar wind density, just over two protons per cubic centimeter. Expect to see a big uptick in the solar wind density, followed by a drop down in the solar wind density and a big increase in the solar wind speed. That'll be the telltale signature of a coronal hole high speed wind stream. And let's look at magnetic data next. So there are our Gros magnetometers, and you can expect to see these readings kind of all over the place here. We're expecting a significant impact from this coronal hole high-speed stream. It could even lead to a KP5 or 6, so don't be surprised to see that. Uh, it all depends on the magnetic field associated with the solar plasma. So next, speaking of solar plasma, let's talk about the heliospheric current sheet. There is a sector boundary crossing here, which looks like it just got delayed. 
So that's an indication that the North Pole sunspots are very strong. So if you watch this sector boundary, you see it whoops moving way up to the east there. Uh, that's a sort of a refutation of what we said yesterday. We thought the southern sunspot in the eastern hemisphere would be very strong, but now it's looking like things have reversed. So it looks like the activity shall be from the northern hemisphere. And that's what that sector boundary crossing movement is telling you. The South Pole current sheet there uh, extending its stay at Earth here for a little bit. So you're sort of back in the last third of the uh, South Pole oriented heliospheric current sheet. Let's take a look at the solar line of sight field plot here. There's the sun's B field depicted in blue, north solar polar field in green, south solar polar field in red, and next coronal holes. So we've got south pole oriented coronal holes here about to become geo effective when that high speed wind shows up and we do have some north pole coronal holes down here in the southeast. So lots of activity going on in the southeast as well. So here's your 24 hour SDO video of that. And uh, yeah, we've got highly likelihood, high, high likelihood here of a major CME and or very large flare from this group as there is certainly some plasma instability happening here just north of the Brian Keating solar filament. We've also got filaments to name. We'll talk about that later in the video. First, we'll move to sunspots. The high speed wind stream from the coronal hole is this coronal hole right here. It is of South Pole orientation. Uh, the sector boundary is, at the moment, it's something like this. North Pole current sheet just kind of peeking through there. All the rest of this is South Pole magnetism. Hopefully that helps. Here's your sunspot view. And yeah, we've had growth of significant numbers of sunspots here. So we're going to have a huge uptick in sunspot number today. Also an uptick in the radio flux. Likelihood of large solar flares like additional X-class flares remains very, very high. <clears throat> Again, I think the most likely spot is from sunspot 3241, this one up here. And let's take a look at sunspots here. Uh, and one thing I wanted to note here, this is uh, just the, the around the time of the flare. You may notice that there's an event happening over here and way over here all at the same time. I'm sorry, over here, this one. So yeah, you'll see a flare right here. Watch up here and over here. Almost a simultaneous flaring event there. Unlikely to be a coincidence, folks. Let us know in the comments what you think. And here's the 24 hours SDO imagery with those same wavelengths. And let's get rid of the 171 angstroms to show a little close up there. Sunspots there at varying different latitudes as we get closer and closer to solar maximum, uh, guess what? We're not there yet. The polar magnetic fields need to leave the poles and sort of stay away from the poles before you can call solar maximum. So anyway, again, growth of sunspots there over the past 24 hours. It's a huge uptick in solar activity. So expect fireworks to continue. It's an exciting time to be covering space weather. And uh, using heliophysics to rewrite cosmology? Anybody? Anybody? Next, we'll move to solar flares and energetic particles, which is, I suspect, the moment everybody's been waiting for. But first, let's take a moment to look at merch. So if you're in the market for some of our merch, you'll save 20% site-wide. It's Redbubble's birthday. So click the link below the video. You'll find our Redbubble shop down there. It'll send you to our merch shop in order of best-selling. If it's too offensive for you, then just ignore that. Uh, and uh, new designs coming out. We've actually got three new designs that are ready to be created. I just haven't gotten around to creating them yet. Today's featured product is the Galactic Federation Special Forces. So Universum Liberate is the motto. As if I could wave my magic wand, I'd set everybody free. As captivity is evil. So, yeah, Universum Liberate. Convince your friends and foes that you're in the Illuminate by wearing a shirt or perhaps having a comforter that says Universum Liberate on it. By the way, we have a Smash Team Duvet cover 
and it has made our sleep better. I mean, that might sound like a crazy thing, but we took our old comforter and threw it inside of that duvet cover, and it's like having a brand new comforter with the glorious Smash Team graphics on it. So loving that. Again, save 20% site-wide. So check out the merch if you're in the market. It's a good time to save some cash and increase your stash of fresh threads for the coming delightful spring months. Make hay while the sun shines, folks, and it does. Although we haven't seen any relativistic particle spikes. So those flares that we've seen yesterday, including that X-class flare, did not cause the GO-16 and it, uh, did not cause the GO-16 to measure any relativistic particles. I don't know where the GOES-18 is. Maybe it's proton monitors turned off. Anyway, let's take a look at flares. And of course, the flare everybody's going to be talking about is this X2 class flare. It's an X2.07. Peak flux around 1750. And I suspect you probably want some footage of that. So here are the three hours surrounding the flare. So we've got some, <laughs> you could say, pretty decent footage here. Uh, yeah, some pretty decent footage indeed. Um, so that's just the three hours, and we've slowed that down to 10 frames per second there instead of the normal 30 that most of our 24-hour videos depict. And what's that? You want to... What did you say? Did you? Are you typing a comment that says you want a closer view of that? Okay. Are you typing a comment that says you appreciate the closeness of that view? Well, of course, on the channel, we... Uh, go above and beyond the call of awesome. So there's 131 plus 304 angstroms from SDO, ionized helium plus iron. Here we've exchanged the 131 angstroms for 335 angstroms. It may show some different structures here as, of course, it's showing different parts of the corona. You can see a little bit of a shock wave there reverberating across the solar surface. And maybe that's too controversial for you to hear. Uh, if so, let us know in the comments. We may have some ideas on some science publications for you to read. But in any case, that's the three hours around the flare. We've moved it a little closer. And how about some more wavelengths? Here's 131 plus 94 angstroms. Those, by the way, are the two wavelengths specifically designed to view solar flares. They take 10 images per minute instead of only two images per minute. We'll let that one play through a second time. I suspect the video is going to be kind of long today as we've got lots of additional footage here for you. So strap in your strap on. I mean, strap on your safety belt because it's exciting stuff. Yeah, here's a little closer view with the wavelengths we started at. As a lot of material is taking a different pathway on its rather fast travels between the chromosphere and corona, for example. So lots of material flying around there. Yowzers, that is indeed some good footage. So again, that's just the three hours around the flare moment. Here we've put up 94 plus 1600 angstroms. What's interesting about 1600 is that it shows ionized carbon. And you're going to see fusion happen before your very eyes here. Watch this brighten up at the surface. All that surface brightening there, that's the 1600 angstroms wavelength. That is carbon being built. Do you have a carbon bicycle being built? Let us know in the comments what you went with. Or if you want to come buy one in the Lehigh Valley, hit me up. I do ride for a bike shop after all. My UCI trade team is theveloshop.net. Check it out. Shout out to Becky. Tell Becky Dan sent you. We are indeed on a first name basis. Perhaps you're on a first name basis with El Sol. Of course, if you've got comments to leave directly for the sun, make sure you leave them in the comments section. Here's 94 plus 131. As close as we're willing to get. <laughs> I mean, we can zoom in. Far, we can zoom in further than that, but. That is That should be sufficient, and we hope you're viewing the videos on a 90-inch screen. The 
There are a lot of lazy channels on YouTube that are paid a lot of money to spout a lot of nonsense about heliophysics. We won't be telling you the universe is electric anytime soon on the channel, as that is fully ridiculous. If you think the universe is electric, please take physics too. Yeah, the solar corona is electric. The chromosphere, you could make the argument, is electric in many ways. Is empty space in between galaxies electric? I would have to say no. Anyway, here's the full disk view. That's 94 angstroms all by itself. Again, you'll see that simultaneous flaring moment happen there when that X flare kicks off. That is not an illusion. There was a flare happening over on that northeasterly sunspot. Here's 131 by itself. And before we continue on, it's time to pause for station identification. Thanks for tuning into the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. We pride ourselves on providing facts and having some dense content. We hope you're a dense viewer, as there's no crime in being dense. Of course, those of us who know things about brain structures are aware that dense brains have a tendency to be the brains of smarter people. Of course, you may be hearing about the conjunctions of Saturn and Mercury as well as Venus and Jupiter, something that hasn't happened for 10 trillion years, and it's very scary and spooky because planets are scary and spooky because reasons. So if you're up before dawn, you might see Mercury and Saturn. If you're up at dusk, you might see Venus and Jupiter. Some bright objects there showing up near the ecliptic. Let's do a solar system forecast to help orient our viewers. That's where stuff is. And here is where stuff will be in one week. So there's the one week forecast for the solar system, as it is very lonely on this side of the solar system. No gas giants and no inner planets either. Earth all by itself in a rather void like portion of space. Yeah. And keep in mind, that's not to scale. Those things are really far apart. So next, looking at some coronagraphs here to see if those CMEs are earthly directed. This is the imagery from George Mason University, and they've got that great computer interpretation model on the left, as well as the raw SOHO Lasco C3 on the right. And there's a really cool CME happening there. Let me press refresh. Something looks funky with this. I don't know if it's missing data. We do have, shall we say, a lot of tabs open today, so... Lots more to go in just the space weather section. And some interesting stuff in the meteorology segment as well. Anyway, that's yesterday's imagery. Those CMEs don't look like they're earthly directed, at least not yet. We'll show you some more detailed imagery here in a minute. Interestingly enough, the Space Weather Prediction Center actually sent uh, a NOAA warning uh, actually a watch about a solar energetic particle event that is a proton, a spike in the proton flux, and we never really saw it come in. Anyway, let's move to Stereo A here. We're going to show Stereo A and Soho Lasco C3. That should help clear things up. Just keep note of the time and date stamps. We're going to let those play through all the way here. And while that plays through, let me just put an arrow here. Uh, the likelihood of additional coronal mass ejections remains at nearly 100%. In fact, I think there's one actually happening as we're streaming the video now. So also really cool CME here with like a, a nucleus in it. That happens sometimes. You have like an outer and an inner bubble on a CME. Uh, as you know, those things are still trying to orient to magnetic fields and trying to decide between gravity and magnetism as they exit the corona. Like, again, likelihood of additional CMEs nearly 100% here because we've got major activity in the northeast. So just as a very active sunspot sets in the northwest, we see a major uptick in solar activity in the northeast. So again, we'll have the radio flux rising higher yet today, the sunspot rising higher yet today. It also looks like the AP index is rising, and no real surprise there. There is a lot of solar plasma on its way out into the greater solar system, just not toward Earth. 
So we've, of course, got some spectacular 24-hour videos with the SDO 304 angstroms and the Soho Lasco coronagraphs. There you go. Here's a slightly more zoomed in view. Multiple events happening there. CME is blasting off in various directions, and that can be very deceptive. It can look like an Earth-directed halo ejection when it's actually not. So, so you know, you, sometimes you get a CME in the opposite side of the sun and one kind of on the earthly side of the sun but not directed toward Earth, and often it looks like a halo when it really isn't. So here's the full zoom. That's at least as far as we'll zoom. And again, all eyes on this area north of the Brian Keating filament because that area right there is ready to jump off. There, is, there are huge plasma filaments, which, which we'll get to here in a moment. And there are, it might be the most filamentary mass that we've ever covered on the channel at the moment. Uh, there are dozens of gigantic filaments, which we're going to show you here in just a minute. So here you go. Let's actually press refresh here, load the newest, just so we have the best data there from Cerro Tololo, Chile. And check out the filament fest. That is, that is serious filaments right there, folks. And, of course, the Brian Keating filament that we covered, it looks like it's actually grown here a bit, so it's more coherent now. This one down here needs a name. Uh, not sure what we should call that one. Also, this one up here ought to get a name. And uh, these over here, these are the. this is actually the Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris. Look at Kamala Harris is moving over the top of Hillary Clinton. Who knew? Who could have guessed? But it's more psychic powers being expressed in our naming of filaments convention. So let's just bring up the latest image and invite you, the viewer, to name that filament. How? By joining us over on Twitter, of course. So we uh, follow the space weather folks over on Twitter quite a bit, as at Smashomash is the official Twitter account of the Smash News Network, least busted name and news. If you want to name filaments after living humans, and it doesn't matter if they're famous or not, just hit us up. Hit us up over on Twitter, and we will name filaments after whoever you like, assuming that there's not already one on the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk that has a name. You can also name prominences. They don't have to be absorption features. Uh, they could be... It could be just a prominence that doesn't show up as an absorption feature here or an absorption feature here that shows up as dark. They are the same feature. Those are coronal filaments. So we name them after living people because it helps us to remember which one is which. Anyway, follow us on Twitter. Again, if you don't have a Twitter account, make sure you check one out. If you're looking for free mushroom gummy giveaways, we still have that going on. So that is pinned to the Twitter profile. Just click the link. It'll send you to the free Mushroom Gummies giveaway page, or if you click the link below this video, you'll see the Hemp Lucid Shop. So, uh, you know, help out the channel with perhaps picking up some Hemp Lucid gear, uh, some great products there. So help us out that way. Enter the promo code SMASHOMASH10 if you're already shopping on HempLucid.com, or perhaps just visit our link. Again, there's a link below the video in the description to the Hemp Lucid shop. Thanks to everybody who's picked up product and thanks to Hemp Lucid. The official website of smashomash.com. The official website is smashomash.com, I should say. So check that out. Help us out with clicks if you're unwilling or unable to pick up some products. Maybe it'll have an effect on your help, on your health to shop at Hemp Lucid. You can find all kinds of links on the home page to the Twitter, a permanent link to the Discord chat as well. So hit us up over there. Discord chat, that's where we will be featuring viewers in call-in shows in the future. So that'll be a thing. Smashamash.com and welcome to each of you to the Neo Renaissance. Here's the past 24 hours in SDO 304 angstroms. Again, eyes on this area right up here because that is a berserk sunspot. There is some serious plasma reorientation happening up there as we speak. And there could be an Earth-directed coronal mass ejection happening. If so, we will make a video later today. We will probably make a video later today regardless. So let's take a look at the last couple of hours here. This is the GO-16 SUVI. 
And yeah, that looks certainly like a CME. I see some limb darkening. I see some material blasting out over here. Uh, yeah. In fact, that looks like multiple CMEs being generated from that area. That's the past about two and a half hours. And we could still see large flares from this sunspot, 3234, as it sets. Anyway, there's the full disk view. Let's move to our bonus feature segment. We don't want the video to be too long, as they've been pushing an hour lately with all the awesome solar activity. So next is our satellites community dashboard. And we've got some minor charging hazards here of the surface charging variety in the Central Pacific. No big deal there. The GOES electron flux shown here. Uh, let's see. Are we expecting? We're expecting a big downtick in the electron flux later today, or later tomorrow at least, as the coronal hole wind stream arrives. That's the past three days as measured by the GOES 16 and GOES 18. There is the NOAA forecast. Uh, I'm not sure what that's all about. Uh, I would expect at least Monday to be way down here. So anyway, that's the NOAA forecast. A little bit of disagreement there. No big deal. There's the one-year chart of the electron flux. Those relativistic electrons are measured at the F layer of the ionosphere. So let's take a look at that also. The F layer is the upper ionospheric layer there. The bridge between Earth and space is about 300 kilometers up. Feel free to pause the video on this frame if you're not familiar with the penetration of electromagnetic radiation, solar thermospheric temperatures, and chemical concentrations. Here's your F layer. And if you're trying to forecast earthquakes by using the ionosphere, then you should use the anomaly gram that we show daily on the channel. Um, it shows the anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median. This is just the plain ionospheric uh, vibrational frequencies. Of course, the highest frequency there occurring around the equator at noontime for the most part. We do see some significant anomalies here, some rather wild swings. Let's bring up the latest image. Once that plays through, we'll make sure that plays all the way through as our videos have been documenting this for years. There's the anomaly gram. That's anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median. So you're going to see some wild swings here from high to low frequency anomaly as things have still not calmed down from the last series of events, coronal hole high-speed stream and coronal mass ejection impacts. So things still a little bit stirred up here in the, here in the ionosphere and you'll see some anomalies that you may not be used to seeing. Of course, most of which are centered over the weakest part, point of Earth's magnetosphere right here over the South Atlantic anomaly. So that's what's going on in the bridge between Earth and space. There's your ionogram, 1515 universal time and 1515 universal time anomaly gram, anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median. We'll also show the total electron content forecast as it gives us other insight into the free electrons between the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt and your GPS handset. It's a run of about 12,500 miles. Those are the most likely places to see GPS errors. And by tomorrow evening, we should see this get a little bit jiggy as this tends to be a little bit more anomalous when we have space weather impacts like coronal hole high-speed streams and CMEs, coronal mass ejections. So at the moment, things are looking pretty normal here. We do have some significant GPS anomalies likely over North America and some low electron anomalies in some spots also. You may see some little holes in the electron content like here at the Caribbean, down here at Argentina, and over here in the Central Pacific. So right there, you see a little hole opening up there off the west coast of South America. Total electron contents depict the free electrons all the way up to the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt down to your GPS handset. Another data set that we show daily on the channel because you never know what you'll find when you immerse yourself in the data, folks. A lot of times in science, we ask questions and we don't get answers to them and we end up with more questions and we end up with answers to questions not asked. So that's sort of what happens on the regs. And let's take a look at our latest high-res imagery here. There you go. There is the closest star, El Sol, Helios, the sun, the local yellow dwarf, whatever you'd like to call it, the latest imagery. We're just going to show this sunspot here again. We don't want the video to be too lengthy. There is the most likely spot to see major events happening here. That is a beta gamma delta class sunspot. Uh, there's huge amounts of magnetic field complexity happening there. You can see the field sort of mixing together, especially in the leading umbra there. So that is a very active sunspot. And again, there could be a CME 
that is earthly directed happening as we make the video. So again, we don't want it to be too lengthy. And let's move to our meteorology segment. So maybe a lot of you are frightened that it's going to be very hot. So there, there you go. For all of you who are who want to be frightened of hot weather, maybe head to Central Africa there as it's 106.1 degrees Fahrenheit. So there, there's a hot temperature for you. And for all of those, for all of you out there who want to be frightened of very cold temperatures, check out Antarctica. How about over 72 degrees below zero? Nearly 74 degrees below zero Fahrenheit there. 73, negative 73.7 degrees in Antarctica. By the way, it's summer down there. Anyway, moving right along here to our meteorology segment. These are the surface winds of the eastern world. Shout out to our viewers from all around the planet. If you've got people that are in this circle, please send them our content. Now keep in mind, folks, space weather videos are relevant in a lot of ways, one of which is economics. So that, you know, Peter Schiff ought to watch our videos as well as Elon Musk because, well, they're relevant to it's, it's kind of important for economics to understand if there is a major CME impact on the way, also to understand heliophysics and cosmology as it leads to human technological advancements. That's one of the most exciting things. If you want to hear more about our mission, head to smashomash.com slash forum slash mission. Those are the jet streams of the Eastern world. Here are the jet streams of the Western world. Yes, we've created a massive web ring to support our operations and people like you, our viewers, who are smart enough and have been able to find the channel. These are the surface winds of the of the Western world. We've got a powerful low here right over Nantucket at the moment. And uh, we'll show you that a little bit later in the video. Surface winds of the central world looking like this. And the jet streams of Europe, Africa, and Asia are looking like that. Here's your weather.gov map. Oh, wait, first we're looking at clouds and fog. Clouds and fog over the Americas, folks. It's the 3.9 nanometer infrared radiation. So that's a NASA GOES satellite spiraling around the croissant-shaped planet and then projecting the imagery onto a fake NASA Adobe Photoshop sphere to try to convince you that the planet is spherical and not shaped like the breakfast pastry, the French croissant. Did, French design, did the French design the planet? Let us know in the comments what you think. So here's your weather.gov map, and we've got gale warnings up the East Coast because of that low. Again, it's moving kind of from Long Island, from Long Island. Yeah, you got to pronounce a hard G. Long Island toward Nantucket, toward Martha's Vineyard. Anyway, there's the key to show you what the weather warnings are. If your location's lit, click your location. We've got a bunch of flood advisories there in the eastern portion of the country. Weather.gov is the site. Again, if your location's lit, click your location. Here are some forecasts. That's pressure and precipitation based on the GFS model. And there's ice on the way. Yeah, some lake effects, freezing rain, snow, and rain coming to Pennsylvania and New York. Also, around the, around the Great Lakes in general. We'll just say that. Anyway, you can see the map. Hopefully, 72-hour GFS pressure and precipitation forecast as snow continues to pummel California. Here's the 72-hour GFS positive accumulated snow depth change in inches. Again, an additional, oh, I don't know, three more feet there for portions of California. As if they haven't gotten enough, it's going to be an epic melt season, so be prepared for flooding, tales of flooding, images of flooding, crop losses, and delayed plants. Well, all kinds of damage. Grain stores can get destroyed by these kinds of floods, and the snow mass balance is quite high, and the snow water equivalent is really, really high. It's, you could say it's a seventh winter of record snowfall for the northern hemisphere. Anyway, again, that's your GFS forecast. We'll also show the wind. Since wind is a story up the entire east coast of the U.S. here, gale warnings. And that low is going to move almost due east there. So that's the GFS 72-hour wind and pressure model. Another low is going to move from the hot air capital of the U.S., Colorado, up toward Lake Michigan. But it's going to be kind of weak, but strong enough to produce some precipitation around the Great Lakes and Mid-Atlantic States and New England. 
So here's your pressure map. Again, you can see that pressure there is kind of right between Long Island there and Martha's Vineyard. It's not a super low pressure though, 989 hectopascals. It's your pressure map from windy.com. Here's your NASA goes lightning mapper. That should be the last about 10 hours. And some thunder and lightning there off the east coast of the U.S. Do we have terrestrial strikes in the U.S.? Not looking like it. Next time you hear thunder, check out lightningmaps.org. It'll allow you to convince the natives that you're Zeus or Thor or something like that, depending on if you're in the Mediterranean or in the Nordic states. Pick Zeus for the Mediterranean and Thor for the Nordic states, if you're wondering. Anyway, there's the U.S. full 50 state view. There's the lower 48 view. Much of New York seeing some additional snowfall there. Clouds and fog are looking like this. And water vapor is looking like that. Looks like clear skies over Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, southern Texas, and Georgia. Maybe not so much Georgia, but certainly, well, it certainly looks like Mississippi's got a clear day. Louisiana, they're like, likely to have clear skies as there's a large high pressure zone here. That's all high pressure. I can tell because it's dry, massive air. Why? Because nitrogen is more massive than water vapor. It's quite simple. If you understand atmospheric physics, here's your recap. U.S. Doppler radar. Clouds and fog expressed as 3.9 nanometer infrared radiation. And last but not least... The water map weather station that shows all the water, not just clouds and fog. It shows dry air as well as moist air. And we like to use the term moist at well, uh, at, anyway. Thanks for tuning in to the Daily Space Weather, the main feature of the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. Congratulations on realizing it exists. We'll see you soon. In the meantime, I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash O'Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind. Be at your back. Please visit links here and here and here.